Hello everyone, thanks for coming outside me today. It is beautiful out here in central Pennsylvania. I'm out here for twofold reasons. One, to scout, but more importantly, I wanna talk about things that you need to have prepped for bow season right now. And this isn't like, oh, get your equipment out and make sure it's okay and shoot your bow. I'm talking like actual things you need to have prepped, like doomsday prepper ready, because when the time comes for something to go wrong in your hunting season, particularly in the archery season, you're gonna to wanna to have it prepped and ready to go to fix the problem, rectify the problem, overnight instead of two or three weeks later. So we're gonna head down this tram road here. We're gonna do some scouting. I shot my buck uh, back in 2019 on the opening day, just down this road a bit. They've done some logging in here though. So I wanna be doing some scouting as well as talking about some of these tips and tricks. So come along, it should be a lot of fun. Also secondarily, I brought a bag of venison jerky. Ironically from the buck, I shot about 400 yards that way. Feels good to be standing on the land that you're literally living off of. It's pretty good. Mm, tasty too. Thing number one, and it is number one because it is the most important to me in terms of this prepping for the bow season, is having an extra set of stringing cables on hand for your bow. Now, if you own multiple bows, this is not as uh, applicable to you, but if you're like the vast majority of archers, and like I was for a very long time, you only have one bow, it's your primary and your backup, it's your hunting, your target, your 3D, everything bow, and that's fine, but it's really a really good idea to have an extra set of stringing cables and particularly now is the time to buy it. You don't want to buy it closer to season. Remember this time, it, okay, I'm going to throw a little bit of uh, numbers, math, and some uh, terminology at you. Remember that once the season starts, archery manufacturers have done their job, right? That was kind of their year. June through September is the Super Bowl in terms of months for sales for archery shops and for archery manufacturers. As soon as the season opens there, kind of like that, some states of course open up as early as September, but right there, that first week of October, their jobs are done, right? So they are now focusing on the ATA show in January, right? Where they start revealing all of their new content. And they only have three months, right? Really October, November, December, they have three three months to get this all geared up and ready to go work out all the kinks and all the fine details. They're not worried about stuff they've already done. And this is true of string builders as well. And their lead times get longer. You might have instead of a week, you might have two or even three weeks. And particularly right now, the situation we're living in with the pandemic, it could be even longer. Trust me, at the shop, we were waiting on a lot of string cables and it's not the manufacturer's fault. They were having problems getting in the actual fibers to make the string and cables. So I would strongly recommend whether there's a pandemic or not whenever you're watching this video have an extra set of stringing cables for your bow on hand I don't even care where you get them you can get high expensive ones you can get the cheap ones you find on eBay you can do whatever, but just have them on hand. You never know when you're gonna nick it on some brush or briar walking down a tram road like this. You're gonna cut it with a broad head, get it stuck in a truck bed. You never know when you're going to need a string or cable. And unfortunately, if you're in an instance where you have to take it to your shop, and then if you have a something like a Matthews or a Prime, where it's like a five or a seven piece set or something silly like that, you could be losing the vast majority of archery season waiting for those string cables to get in if your shop doesn't have them in stock. So I would have them in stock so that way you can walk right in to your bow shop hand them the string cables, and depending on how busy they are, they might be able to do it while you wait. They can get those things repaired, get them fixed, and you'll be ready to go hunt the next day instead of weeks later. Very, very important. I always keep a set of string cables on hand for my hunting bow in particular. My target bow I don't worry about so much, but my hunting bow always have that because I want that to be ready to go in the event that I need to fix it. So number two is kind of a cheat because it goes hand in hand with number one. And I forgot to mention with number one real quick before I get to number two, that even though it's your backup set of string cables, it becomes next year or two or three down the road when you actually need to replace string and cables, you already have it in hand and you can get it done a lot faster as well. And then at that point, you could just buy next year's or the next time. So you really only eat that cost once to be always continuously prepared for the lifetime that you own that bow. All right, let's get to number two. Number two goes hand in hand with number one, and it's a little bit of a cheat because it's owning all the little pieces and parts and extra bits, and particularly if they're plastic or if they're screws or any module parts that are very specific to your bow, if you can have a backup of them, I would strongly recommend it. Uh, for me, shooting Elite, I like limb stops, of course, that's what come on Elite bows, and I always keep an extra one or two in the shop because they can sometimes rattle loose and maybe I have to replace it, I lose it. 
Um, the old Matthews bows, the single cam, some of them did have one on the bottom, obviously being a single cam. And if you lost it, you could potentially overdraw your bow and lock it up. Whoo, that's a bad news. Um, so it's always a good idea to have those little parts and pieces and extra screws um, just to have around. They're just a few bucks and you have them for the lifetime of the bow. Obviously, they're not going to go bad. Uh, so that's another good thing to have as well. Number three in this list, as I'm rambling along, has to deal with these two trees right here. These are the two red oaks. I'm in that red oak flat where I shot my buck last year in 2019. This is not relying on you prepping as much as it is understanding the prep and the layout of the land. So this area was recently kind of logged back closer to the access to the parking lot up in the front here and uh, there are two green fields that are not uh, they're not farmed they're just kind of cut but sometimes they are cut for hay and they're deliberately cut uh, a couple times throughout the spring and summer and it's kept very short and the deer hammer it of course it's full of like almost like a chicory lots of clover alfalfa timothy that sort of stuff and the deer just pound it here this year, they clearly let it get tall. This is my first time out here this year. They clearly let it get tall and they have just brush hogged it recently because we have uh, about this much here of uh, actual ground and then everything else is just brown stubble and it's just pretty nasty. Either that or they let it get tall, they cut it and they're waiting to windrow it, but I don't think so. It looks like it's gone brush hogged. I'll have to get up there. When these are brush hogged or they're left to go tall, it drastically changes the dynamic of how this place hunts. And this is the prep that you need to make now. Whether you hunt private or public land, you have to be aware of the situations with what is available to the deer in terms of food source and particularly in that early season. If you're in a situation where like here, we have this red oak flat, which is of course a huge part of the food out here, but also these potential uh, green fields where they could be in, that changes the bedding, that changes their patterns, and you need to have that prepped. I would hate to come in here thinking, oh yeah, I had great success last year, came into this acorn flat, this red oak flat, maybe there's no acorns. I brought my binos today to look up into the canopy, hopefully we got some. Maybe there's no acorns, maybe these, uh, maybe they planted these one year into beans or into corn and the deer hide in that, they bed in that, maybe they eat all night in that. I have no idea. Last year, I came in here and scouted very briefly. This was cut hay uh, and it was very short, you know, about six to eight inches and it was all green. And the deer were clearly, because I came by, were allowed to spot in PA, came by late at night, spotted into the fields um, and uh, was able to see there's deer out here, which means they're probably coming back through. The fields are out this way behind the camera. They're probably coming back through in order to bed back in this uh, um, dead ash swamp. All the ash trees that were in there have died. It's allowed a very thick, lush undergrowth and they love to bed in that all year round. So I was able to identify that. This year, it looks like these are not gonna be nearly as high of food sources unless they cut them. This field I can actually see is still pretty tall. Uh, it looks to be about three, four feet tall. So they might bed out in that because um, they get some nice wind shear and a little bit of shade and that sort of thing. There's probably some natural brows, of course, in the undergrowth, but it's not gonna be nearly as palatable or desirable as a nice cut hay field. So that's something to prep for. And just to recap, string cables, any little parts of your bow, and now for the first step coming outside and make sure that you are prepped in terms of is the land prepped for you to hunt. Obviously there's nothing I can do. This is public land to me. I'm not gonna come out here and burn off the stubble of the hay field or do this, that, and the other thing. There's nothing I can do, but I need to make sure that my stand sets areas are prepped. I've hunted out of this tree a lot. Depending on how these fields go here uh, in August, September to our opener on October the 3rd this year, this might not be a good set until these acorns really start dropping in late October, early November. We'll see. Last year was a nice blend of everything coming together. This year, not so sure. So that's number three. All right, so we made it out to the edge of the field here. It's actually windrowed for hay. So this might be a very, very interesting spot to hunt again this year. But anyhow, we're here on this field edge here. I'm taking a stare at some of these oak trees. We got some really good acorns on the edge because they're getting a lot of sunlight. That's not the key to this video though. Number four is so the first one, string cables, two is the parts, and three is prep by knowing the area. And that's why I'm glad I walked all the way out here. I had assumed they just brush hogged, but in reality they had windrowed it for hay. So if we get some rain here, we might actually get some nice undergrowth. The stubble's about five to eight inches tall. Uh, and if we can get some nice rain, maybe we'll have some nice undergrowth of clover and other more palatable species 
uh, other than just you know the the Johnson grass and the cereal rye or the that sort of stuff. So, thing number four in terms of things you should be prepping right now is right now you have to be shooting broadheads. If you are not shooting broadheads and getting used to broadheads, now is the time. And I know you said, oh, Nate, earlier at the beginning of the video said, oh, shoot the bow. We all know that. Yeah, I know. But shooting the bow, we all know that. I'm talking shooting broadheads and shooting broadheads on the norm. Like, I fall guilty of this a lot because shooting broadheads isn't fun. Choose up your targets. You have to resharpen. You know, I shoot Magnus heads, so they're nice and easy to resharpen. But if you don't shoot that, you shoot a replaceable blade, you shoot a mechanical, it's like, ugh, I gotta replace blades, I got bent ferrules if you shoot a, a flimsier broadhead. There's a lot of things that can go wrong. And it's wasted money, and that's no fun. Excuse you. I'm having fun with this video today. This is a lot of fun. But you have to start shooting your broadheads because you don't know what's going to fly incorrectly. So here's the point with the prep. Go out, you'll shoot your field points, everything's fine. Go out and shoot your field points with a different grip. I, I harp on grip and grip focus and grip tuning because it is your only point of contact to the bow. Okay, it's your only point of contact. So this is everything that can go wrong, pretty much, except for like copious amounts of face pressure when you're anchored at full draw, you can push into the string. But predominantly it's the grip. When you have wonky grips with field points, you might have a little bit of opening of, your, of, uh, of groups with your spread, and depending on how accurate you usually are, you might not even notice. When you go and shoot, and particularly a fixed blade broadhead, but it's true of mechanicals too, because they still do have blades that stick out. I want you to go at 20 yards and add a lot of ring side pressure to your grip, add a lot of thumb side pressure, try shooting with a high wrist, try shooting with a medium wrist, try shooting with a low wrist, and see what happens to your broadhead flight. Okay, I am almost willing, willing to wager money, and particularly when you add ringside pressure, because that's almost like you're, you're gripping the bow, like you would hold a, you know, you pick up a, a cup or a baseball. I'm almost willing to wager money that your broadheads are going to fly three to four inches off at 20 yards. I'm almost willing to wager money, even if you've done all of the tuning necessary, because believe me, I've seen it because I do it myself, okay? If your broadheads aren't flying right, because in the heat of the moment, you're not going to think, okay, i got to have this perfect pressure point and I have to anchor correctly. It's going to be, oh snap, there's a deer, in particular if you're new to, the, new to the sport. It's going to come in, oh snap, there's a deer, draw back, maybe have to bleed to stop it, and you're going to squeeze that sucker off and you're going to send a broadhead at it. If your grip is wrong and you're already going to be off three to four inches, you need to know that now. And that's why it's important to have a really well-tuned arrow because that helps correct a lot of those problems. But if you kind of have a half-baked tuned arrow or an arrow that's not tuned at all, and in particular if you want to try to shoot a fixed blade broadhead like a grown-up, it's a great idea to try the torque tuning. It really is. Prep for it now. Know, okay, in the heat of the moment, if I grip like this, I shoot four inches to the right, you need to rectify that now. Because trying to figure that out in September, like two weeks before the season starts, you know, trying shooting the broadheads, and you're all over the place, even though your arrow's been flying great all summer, and you did the bear shaft tune, the knock tune, and, and the fletch, and through the paper, and all that sort of stuff, and all of a sudden your broadheads are flying weird, not all the time, but some of the time, I'm willing to wager it's a grip issue. Really pay attention to that, focus to that, because you could really end up the creek without a paddle, make a poor shot at a deer, and particularly when you get past 20 yards, because things just compound 25, 30, 35, 40. So pay attention to that. Let's keep walking around. I'm enjoying getting out today. All right, so I moved up here to check this uh, other field. It is not cut, which usually uh, it never is cut. Like if they let it grow tall, they just leave it grow tall and they let it go all through rifle season. So deer will bed out through here as long as this goldenrod, this Johnson grass. Uh, there's some rye in there, rye grass type stuff, um, pigweed and that sort of stuff. If, it, if they leave it go tall, that's really cool. And that's good to know because uh, deer will now bed in that when it does get cold. South facing slope, it gets the sunlight um, more often than of course a north facing slope or a west facing slope. That east and south uh, facing slopes, if that, tall, if that stuff is tall enough in the winter time, it's good to have this prep now. If that stuff's tall in the winter time, they can get a wind shear by bedding down in it, but they can still get sunlight down to the ground. Uh, and particularly if there's snow, they'll really be able to get in there. Number five has to deal with understanding, prepping your brain to understand how the areas you want to hunt, how the food sources change throughout the year. This is so critical to understand. 
You have your summertime browse, right? We have all this stuff over here. We have all this cat briar and, and green. It's nice, it's, it's uh, nice and soft and palatable, but as soon as that stuff turns yellow, as soon as it turns brown, as soon as it turns hard and dry, the deer are going to abandon it. They might bed in it, but they're going to abandon it in terms of food source. That is no longer a viable resource for them. Or if it's a woody stem thing, like a dogwood, mountain laurel, uh, that sort of, you know, they uh, uh, buds on trees, that, is, that will become palatable later. And by palatable, I mean they're gonna have to deal with it because it's the only food source that's left. Once that green dies off, they're then gonna hit whatever is green that is left until the acorns fall. Last year was very different because our acorns fell super early because we had such a wet spring and summer. It just rained every day last year. This year it's going to be very different. I think we're gonna have a lot of very stressed deer. They're gonna be hitting food as soon as it hits the ground. So I checked out that field edge with those red oaks. They were loaded, but they are not ready to drop. It does probably will not drop until they usually do later in October, unless they get super stressed because we don't get rain, then they drop sooner. Either way, I think we're gonna have a lot of stressed deer in a lot of different places that don't have ag, which we don't have ag here. They're not getting the uh, moisture they need. They're gonna be seeking plants that have moisture and they're gonna be seeking just food in general because it's gonna be dried out and it's gonna be so brittle. This is so important to understand because the deer might leave here, right? If we don't get rain and there's no good palatable underbrows, there's too many deer for the underbrows, which doesn't look like, it looks like we have a lot of good brows through here. Understanding all of that is very important and very critical because that might mean your deer aren't there in your spot the first two weeks of the season, three weeks of the season, and then as soon as your acorns drop, they're back to you and they just come out of nowhere. That could be why. So it's super important and super critical to understand that. I think the farmer's coming over to bay. Hey, I think he is. Here's another piece of summertime prep. Once he's done baling all this stuff, if we get a rain here in the next couple of days, that's gonna shoot up some green growth and I can come out here and scout these fields at night. So anyhow, understanding how your food sources change throughout the year and prep your brain for that. Going from the green, going to acorns, so on and so forth. Well, as much as it pains me to say it, that's all for this video. If you have any questions about other things that I'm prepping for continuously from the beginning of the season, because there, trust me, there are several more. These are just kind of the big ones. Okay, this video would be several hours long if I got to the mall. Follow me on Facebook, Instagram, send me an email. You can leave a comment here on YouTube, of course. Hope you're able to get outside, enjoy the sport of archery, archery hunting if you so choose. Definitely enjoy God's beautiful creation, and we'll get to see you next time.